Hey everyone, I'm now with my friend Lizzie Horton, um, who's currently living in Manchester and has been for a few years, I think. Um, and we met through Extinction Rebellion a um, couple of years back. Actually, it feels like longer than a couple of years back, but things have moved so quickly. Um, yeah. And yeah, we did do a uh, recorded conversation a few days back, but I, I stupidly messed up the technology and it didn't record. So we're trying again. Um, and we started off with you telling me and the audience, or you reminding me and telling the audience um, what your involvement with XR has been since the beginning. Um, so I don't know if you want to give a sort of brief history again of like your involvement from the beginning and, and sort of mention how me and you met. If that's cool. Yeah. Um, I always try to do this really briefly and it never really works, but I'll try well, again. It doesn't, um, I mean, it doesn't have to be brief. It can be as long as it takes. Like, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe it's something I can feed back on um, in the, in later in the interview. Um, so yeah, I, I was, um, I just started my job in the University of Manchester Students' Union as activities officer, um, running on a sustainability manifesto. Um, I studied there and I worked a little bit with um, my friend from home, Dave Durant, and he was um, really good friends with Roger Hallam. Um, and they did divestment campaign like the year before until Roger did divestment campaign a little bit more at the Uni of Manchester and so I kind of knew Roger through that never really met him but spoken a lot on the phone and yeah I was sat at my desk one day um, in August 2018 and I got an invite from Roger to like this page and I just remember thinking what the hell they had this like weird looking symbol like bright green symbol on a black background, words extinction rebellion on it. The stray. Um, and yeah, like back to, am I? Oh no. Um, maybe if I try, and is that better? No. Okay, I'll try and um. It's okay get now. Date, data. Sorry. You're, you, you've just been cutting in and out a bit. Pardon? The image, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, shall I start again? I don't know. Well, I think we heard, we heard that Roger Hallam was doing a divestment campaign and, and that linked into Manchester Uni somehow and then he invited you to like. He invited me to like the Facebook page, um, and I did. And then I think that evening I got home to a message on Facebook saying, "Hey, I'm from Extinction Rebellion. Do you want to get involved?" And I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Like, how do you who, what?" Um, remembered that I liked the page, and I was like, "Yeah, cool. Like, tell me a bit more about it. it sounds interesting." And a little bit intrigued, a little bit like confused about what this is, um, and. The person at the other end of the message messenger um are uh, like said yeah we will like give us your number we can talk more about it on the phone it'll be easier um can, yeah get you more involved that way so i did um got a call a couple of days later from robin um and he was just yeah he told me more about it and i was really robin boardman yeah robin boardman yeah um and i was really interested and i was like yeah i came off the phone to him and being like, wow, I've never really kind of explored this approach um, in like in the climate act, like in climate activism before. Like I'd I'd been a kind of I wouldn't describe myself as a climate activist, but I'd been involved with the divest protest, uh, yeah, the the divestment movement at university for the past two years, um, and always been involved with like different kind of environmental things at school as well. Um, but yeah, never really knew much about like kind of the the insides of activism um and yeah I was really interested I was like wow I guess I, I was kind of also really desperate like most people were when they first joined XR um and being like okay if this is a totally new like strategy then maybe it could actually change and it seems to be pretty radical and 
like out there and kind of attention grabbing so why don't we give it a go um and then yeah a couple of phone calls later i remember um agreeing to help put on some talks the heading for extinction talk um for uh yeah for for xr for extinction rebellion um in manchester because i worked at the union and i could get rooms and stuff and i was like yeah that's that's my role i can do that um so robin invited me to a talks and trainings meeting and you were there and i think that's where we first met <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> And there was some other people there, I can't really remember. I haven't seen them since. Um, oh, they're not important. <laughs> <laughs> they're not key characters in this story. No. Um, and yeah, so I uh, I came to the first ever online meeting. Um, I remember being quite nervous. Never really done an online meeting before. And I wasn't one before, before I started my job, I wasn't one to kind of take part in things or be a voice in a meeting. I was quite shy. Um, and yeah, I remember coming out of that meeting, at having agreed to uh, do this, to a talk, because they'd already planned one in Manchester on the 10th of September, which was a day after my birthday. Um, and yeah, I'd agreed to uh, deliver it with Robin. Um, and it was two weeks away and I just remember being like, shit, oh my God, like, what do I do? I don't public speak, I've never done public speaking before. Like, I'm really nervous. I kind of think this guy's hot, so I'm going to have to impress him as well. Um, and, yeah, so, like, yeah, really, really nervous. Got the script, read through it. Um, and then I remember speaking to you on the phone um, because I think we, yeah, decided to be buddies. Um, I can't remember how, but I think maybe no. Robin suggested it. Um, and I really liked that idea, and I just, yeah, remember thinking that was a really special thing to just have somebody that I'd never properly met in the flesh um that I could just speak to and it was like really liberating and yeah we had some good conversations didn't we yeah um and one of the things that you said to me to kind of try and calm my nerves about doing this talk was uh remember that you are not um remember that you're not leading this group when you're talking um, or something along these lines when you're talking to people that you're not like you know you're not leading it um, you are a server of information that's being given to you yeah and I just remember thinking that that flipped it on its head and I was like wow yeah like oh my god like I'm no better than anyone I'm an equal I'm if not like you know less intelligent than most people but I have been given this information in it's blown. I've kind of taken that as a little mantra in life um so Lovely. thank you for that that's all right yeah the idea of <laughs> servant leadership you, you kind of cut up you, you it's, it's back again now but it went all a bit wobbly there i don't know why anyway oh, no. um oh. but it was fine we didn't lose any information um so since then you've done other talks and also trainings workshops you've done you've done nvda non-violent direct action training haven't you that you delivered that training yeah, yeah yeah so i quickly got into that um into that team i did I did an mba two weeks after the, the talk that i delivered and then um yeah did my first one like maybe a couple of weeks after that in manchester again um again didn't prepare um did it with joel who i'd been doing a lot of um the heading for extinction talks with um across the country and yeah it seemed like like a really amazing thing to do um and i think i've kind of found my yeah my passion for doing for delivering workshops um i think this is something we spoke about last time was the kind of um the difference in in like what it is to deliver a talk and to deliver a workshop um and yeah i just like the the workshop workshops i love i really love doing I've, I've recently joined the consent team and i also do the consent ad advocacy workshops and I, I think there's just like a really amazing um element of like co-learning and co-teaching um and you know you're never like you say you're never the leader in this situation you're always kind of serving what you've got but like even more so in a workshop and it really kind of goes against what we've we've learned or how we've learned to to be or to learn things since you know a really early age in primary school where it's just been this one 
one way system of information from the teacher to the student and no kind of yeah no reciprocity if that's the right way to say that word um and with workshops it's just like I, I learn something new every time um because there's so many different people that turn up to these workshops and they're expecting so many different things and they have they bring so many different experiences and um it's yeah it just get, it, like it gives a, an amazing space and like yeah space for people to voice these opinions and yeah it's amazing how much you know from one script you can get so many other kind of aspects and perspectives from that yeah and 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 to reflect some of that back i think um i mean i i haven't done any workshops yet i haven't facilitated any with xr i would like to the only the only sort of workshop situation that i've kind of helped with a little bit once was a theatre of the oppressed a theatre workshop but i didn't play much of a role and i definitely would like to do more workshop facilitating but um yeah just like to reflect back that i mean we both know people in xr i think who have really apart from yourself and myself as well i think lots of other people with extinction rebellion have gained confidence um personal confidence and social confidence and and social experience and and experience with delivering talks and de doing workshops and so yeah I, I just want to sort of tell the people who are, who are watching this as well that you know we are going to be saying lots of critical things about XR things that we're not happy with and so on but that doesn't detract from all the positives that it's given us as a movement and and um, and and yeah, I think we both acknowledge that it's been really positive for so many different people, um, not just in terms of learning about activism and doing something productive about the climate and ecological and human humanitarian and economic crisis crises, but also like just teaching us skills that we've not learned before. Um, so yeah, I don't know how how you were going to carry on with your history with xr but do you want to talk about what your history has been with it with actions in in like specifically with actions if you if you weren't going to say something at all i don't know if you yeah um so i mean yeah i guess that that was like the beginning of me getting involved in the kind of organizational part of xr um joined the talks and trainings group and from doing the talks and the trainings um yeah kind of uh started organizing things and then the um the declaration came on the 31st of october uh and i signed up to be a steward um which i was again really nervous about because all these cool kind of experienced activists were there already knew what to do and i was just there like i've i've, I've never done like anything like this before yeah. um and also it's just like the nerves of you know that ner the nerves that still you still get um however many actions you've done with xr or any um any kind of movement um the nerves of like just not knowing what's going on but that complete excitement of like yeah of the unknown before an action um and yeah so i, I did that and that was that was a really amazing day yeah, it was um, a great day yeah. and greta greta thunberg spoke and she said um yeah. something like um we can't play by the rules anymore because the rules need to change and and then <laughs> it, it's time to rebel or something and that was such a great moment <laughs> it was so so brilliant and just like the i think that was the kind of moment where everyone who had been working up to this point had been like just realized like oh okay so this is actually working like we've actually got somewhere like all the all of the work that we've done so far has actually made something happen and you know we expected i remember simon bramwell one of the co-founders saying we we expected like what 500 people there and 1500 people turned up yeah amazing and we blocked the road outside parliament for three hours um with no kind of yeah no n nothing else that had happened in xr like that big before just yeah it was amazing yeah um and then that kind of led on to the two weeks of kind of yeah active rebellion um kind of culminating in this action on the 17th of november where we took over six five bridges six bridges oh god i can't even remember um yeah. six thousand people i think that was 
yeah, 6,000 people, five bridges um, for a day. And um, I was somehow asked to, I think it was because I knew Roman, um, I was kind of asked to help coordinate the takeover of Waterloo Bridge. Um, so it was me, Roman and Joel, um, the Waterloo Three, as we, we refer to ourselves. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, that was like, yeah, I remember thinking, shit, looking back on the last three months, I never thought I would ever be here, you know, like coordinating this mass action where so many people just take over this huge bridge in London on one of the busiest days of the year. So there was like four different football matches going on or something crazy. Um, and that was, that was a real taster into how, uh, how, how much you organise an action and it still doesn't go to plan, um, but in a really positive way because we had spent the night before um, the three of us at Romans um, just like really nervous, trying to calm our nerves with beer and being like kind of not wanting to stay up too late because we were just like, no, we need sleep. We need, we need to get up at 5 a.m. We need to do this. Like it's all got to be perfect. Otherwise we're just like showing the media that we're completely crap. Um, and obviously, the, you know, there were coordinators of the other bridges and we were all trying to like figure out what was going on. And then we had like late night messages from people about the police kind of saying no you're not doing this and it was all just really exciting <laughs> and we got to waterloo bridge um with the different people so there were um i think there were kind of stewards there there were arrestee support maybe um well-being coordinators and some other kind of some other coordinators and we we're all basically working together we met in this cafe near at the bottom of waterloo bridge um I remember just being like, oh my God, like a complete ball of nerves. Um, and yeah, just, ugh. Um, and then we were like, okay, cool. We've got, we've got all the materials, we've got the banners, we've got the people, loads of people were waiting down on the South Bank, um, down in the South Bank Centre, or if I'm, I can't remember my geography, I think that was the place. Um, but yeah, so me and Joel made our way down the other side of the bridge, um, police officers were following us and we were like oh god this has gone completely wrong um and we were quite late anyway we like we got we made it to the south bank center where there were like maybe 200 people there um got up onto this pedestal thing and just started saying the plan we were like okay right um so we've got the affinity group we've got the kind of high risk affinity groups who are going to take the road and then everyone else once you hear the signal you just fill in um and everyone was like asking questions and we, we were like oh my god like okay um 15 minutes later after like answering questions we were like you know what we've just got to go and do it we're late we've got to do it the other group are going to be there already they're going to be like where are the other group made it up onto the bridge all the affinity groups who were like planned on taking the road like striding ahead me and joel with our banners and flags and stuff like you know running ahead feeling like we're super important and got to the middle of the road where all this like you know all the cars had been like j like jamming up until until we got there and we we're like what is going on got into the middle of the road and hundreds of people were already just sat on the on the road doing uh, like singing to each other and eating and sharing food and we were like it's like half an hour since we said like like advertise the time for everyone to take um take the road and people are already here already sharing their bread and um just having fun and we were like what how has this happened <laughs> and the other group weren't even there like the north group weren't even there yet and i remember the, ringing roman and being like it's happened people are already rebelling like this is <laughs> like this system is changing we're winning <laughs> and just having this utter sense of ecstasy of just like yes people get it like people just are confident because we've given them this amazing sense of confidence and empowerment that like you just get on and do it because you know it's right and that was just like yeah one of the right, most amazing yeah. days Amazing, yeah. I'm, I'm confused now because I I interviewed Larch the other day, um, and he was up a tree in Crackley Woods um, on the HS2 line, and I it was amazing. I interviewed him just before he was arrested and wow. taken out of the tree. Um, but in that conversation, um, I asked him what bridge we were on, and he said Waterloo. But he's got that wrong because if you were on Waterloo, we weren't on Waterloo. I, I don't know which bridge we were on. I, I I need to um I need Lambeth? To... No, it might have been Blackfriars. It was it was one at the edge. It was at the edge and it was it was the one that had the least amount of people on it. Oh yeah, I think that was Blackfriars. Yeah. yeah. But um I got arrested like 
Larch wanted someone to take charge of the banner because there weren't many people who were really wanting to put themselves forward. Like there were lots of people who were sort of up for the civil disobedience, but not many people who were feeling that confident. And because Larch was a coordinator of this one of the sides of the bridge, and because I already knew him fairly well, he asked me whether I would like sort of go on ahead with him and unfurl the banner but not he didn't want to put his hands on the banner he didn't want to get arrested that day because he said it, it wasn't sort of part of his life plan to get arrested that day so <laughs> um which was fair enough um and i remember unfurling the banner and then shouting down the road because there were a whole load of police as soon as we started un unfurling the banner me and a couple of other people the police just sort of suddenly appeared from i mean we had part we walked past them we knew they were there so they suddenly appeared from further down the road and so we as we were unfurling the banner or as we had just unfurled it we started edging ourselves backwards towards the center of the bridge walking backwards face like facing off the cops they were slowly walking towards us a line of them we were slowly walking backwards and then most people most of the activists were still further back behind the cops walking slowly up the street and so we had to shout to them, hurry up, get behind us, because, you know, we were feeling a bit flimsy, like just facing mm -hmm. this group of cops. And then they got mostly young, young students, they got behind us. And then suddenly we felt safer. And I remember Larch saying, <laughs> like something out of a film, we've taken the bridge, we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was such a kind of, yeah, glorific moment yeah. I, I want that word so much but yeah it just it was like something out of a film wasn't it mm. but i got so i got arrested so quickly like i was one of the first little bunch that was arrested and it was slightly disappointing in a way because then later i heard about the sort of the the march of the bridges where the different people from the bridges joined gradually joined each other and formed yeah. one procession towards parliament but I missed all of that because I was oh, no. in a police cell. But um, it, it was all right, eating a Ginster's pasty or something. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it is. But, yeah. Yeah, that's that, the way it goes sometimes. Yeah, and I, I, I get such bad FOMO um, from that kind of thing um, because I just remember, like, I think we were the last bridge. For people to pick up i don't know how that would have worked i feel like we weren't like on the edge but maybe we were yeah. um but we had this massive long rebel for life banner as well on the edge and i just remember um let's just like sitting around and then hearing this like cool of somebody being like they're coming they're coming and everyone <laughs> just stood up and looked over the top of the banner that people were holding on the edge and saw this like in the real distance like this huge huge mass of people just like slowly walking towards with Man. the rebel for life banner like oh, on the other side I remember running up onto one of the barriers like standing up on it and just being like oh my god <laughs> like this is incredible and just that feeling of the two groups just like merging and all the chanting and then like the banners touched and everyone was like ah! yeah and then there, there was this awkward <laughs> moment where both the banner like people holding the banners were like okay we're Right, we're kind of stuck now. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, turn around with this, like, you know, twenty-foot banner. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it does seem like such a kind of a short time ago that, in a weird way, but yeah. also in a weird way, it seems like it kind of sounds really cheesy, but like it seems like the beginning of you know the new life. Um, just this kind of. Um, yeah like how how much xr has changed my life and i know that it's changed like so many others lives um similarly like you were saying it just does seem like a completely different world that we've entered um i mean it is in a way you know like we did change the world um well we were part of changing the the world and the the, the kind of conversation yeah. of the world time um i think it, just, yeah. yeah sorry no it, it was a big rite of passage for um, many of us mm. um, um, I think getting arrested 
um, for, for activism is in itself a rite of passage. Um, and but even, even for people who didn't get arrested, I think it's still being part of the early, the, the, the big Extinction Rebellion actions, I think is, yeah, it's kind of rite of passage and, and a kind of cultural, like you say, it has changed the culture. I think, like, because the Fridays for Future, the, the school strikes movement was sort of gaining ground at the same sort of time. So I think those mm. two movements, XR and, and Fridays for Future and the school strikes, those two together, I think, really changed the global culture um, of, uh, like, around climate activism anyway, yeah. Um, and, and then since then, there's been other movements which I think have been inspired by XR's example, like you've got Green Anti-Capitalist Front and you've got the Earth Strike. Do you remember Earth Strike? Mm, yeah. that, that was inspired by XR pretty much, I think. Um, and other things coming up as well. So, um, so do you just want to say a little bit about what other actions you've been involved with since the bridge blocks? Yeah. Um, well, actually, before the bridge blocks with my first arrest, I'll just oh. touch on that briefly. <laughs> um, so that was like the first week of the two weeks of re active rebellion um, in November 2018. Um, and there were different actions going on each day. And I joined one, um, I think, on the Wednesday. And it was an action against, uh, well, I, I remember originally being against Downing Street. And we were supposed to basically go um, outside Downing Street with our little affinity group that we just created and spray the floor or the walls or the gates of Downing Street um, with just yeah XR symbols and whatever we wanted. Um, and so we went to try and do that. I think I was in an affinity, affinity group with Ian Bray at that time. Um, okay. I'd kind of got to know him relatively well from just doing talks in the North and also him just being like a really wonderful human being. Yeah, a good um, and, so yeah i remember him and me being like the the kind of l the last two or la last few people to actually manage to go and do this spray because the police were there you know they had the kind of the, the security guards behind the gates with their guns it was all a bit it was getting a bit like yeah um too too much kind of excitement and too much ner too many nerves um too much energy and people that police were just dragging out to the staff as soon as they kind of you know made a quick move and it was uh, yeah and Ian was like come on we've got to do it now or never and I was like oh no no I can't do it I'm too scared I'm too scared um and he just went and did it rugby tackle to the ground by a police officer um and I was like right walk away walk away walk away anyway I managed to like find somehow myself in this group in this other group who had like a fractured part of my original affinity group and this other one and we all kind of made our way down to um down the road to Defra um the department of energy farming and rural affairs uh which i told the judge i had researched beforehand uh, <laughs> still can't remember the name properly but um anyway yeah we got there because we'd heard that there was another affinity group there about to go and do some spraying um got there the walls were completely covered in graffiti um and me and this woman called Rosie who I became really good friends with afterwards and we're like okay well let's just do it like we're here now we've made it this far we've got this adrenaline in our, in our body we may as well use it for something and just after we got there two police vans pulled up police got out and just like you know patrolling the area the, the people who had done the spraying had like completely vanished um it was like a crime scene and we just looked at each other and we were like look back at the police officers and then we looked at each other again and we're like do it grab the <laughs> grab the cans from our pockets found this tiny little bit of wall that hadn't been graffitied and just each did an xr symbol um like swiftly after that again got like you know roughly shoved off by the police officers um and that was the first <laughs> the first photo of me doing an xr action um just kind of standing there grinning with my <laughs> with my hands in handcuffs with this police officer telling me something and me just being like what have I just done oh my god who am yeah. I like what have I joined what am yeah. I doing <laughs> like all these thoughts running in my head just being like ah that was a but great, also 
<laughs> so was that was it so was it you who did some of the pink the bright pink yeah it's oh no i think i i was i was i had the blue can because i still got the oh, stain in my oh, okay anyway yeah. you're, you're standing next to the pink yeah That's yeah i remember that kind of shade of pink and i've used this in my twitter profile uh looks really good because I, <laughs> cause I've cut out the because I've cut out the CLI, so it just looks like mate, act now. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Quite good, yeah. Um, yeah, Joel told me the other day that that was the weirdly like I just remember being so nervous and not really knowing what to do, and all my friends like around me kind of staring at me, but and I'm being like oh my god and he was like yeah that's the, that's the first and only time you've ever winked at me and i've ever seen you wink and i was like did i oh my god, <laughs> and i just i can imagine myself being like yeah this is like a movie star like wink. <laughs> <laughs> but it did feel like that like it felt like you know at, at one point we were on the big world stage because of what we were doing and like you know, it wasn't because we were doing anything more important, but it was because at that time, like there was a, you know, we were at a tipping point where the world was watching what was going on with the, with the, you know, the, the crisis and the government. And then there was just these like two incredibly energized movements of just like full force, something you'd never seen in like decades that just kind of hit, yeah, hit the attention, grabbed the attention. And then what other, what other mischief, arrestable mischief did you get up to after the bridge block? So you got arrested oh. then, and then you got arrested during the bridge blocks, did you? No, managed to get out of that one, even though okay. I was put on bail. Um, went back to Manchester a couple of days after the bridge block, and we did a big march in Manchester to town centre um, with about 450 people, I think. Um, oh, you organised that, didn't you? Or co co yeah. yeah, Yeah, a group of us... Um, the original Manchester crew <laughs> um, organised that and we were just again blown away by how many people joined and I think it was because you know like a lot of people couldn't make it down to London so they were like yeah let's do this mm. um, people from all over the north came and yeah it, it, we marched around we we sat in the road we like yeah did spontaneous kind of sit-ins in the middle of the road the police were asking us to move and we did some really amazing speeches from different people um, and then made our way back to the central library um, and quite a significant uh, St Peter's Square, significant um, kind of radical spot in Manchester where a lot of different protests take place. And um, we were sitting there and um, just like, you know, doing loads of amazing speeches. And then it kind of st started to disperse a little bit. And there was a group of us who were just like, we're not done with this. So we randomly decided to just go and sit in the road just next to, like just off the square. And I don't know why we chose that road. It was a busy road. Um, yeah we were just like we're making a point here and it was amazing we all there were i think 12 of us who sat in the road with this huge amazingly beautifully painted banner mm. um i can't remember what it said now i think the police still have it um but yeah the police would they came over they were asking us to move and it took about two hours for anything to happen so it obviously wasn't that like urgent that they moved us from the road but yeah we all got arrested then um and that was like a really amazing thing it was like cool this thing's happened in London and we're like my mycelium and we're going to bring it up north and it's happening in one of the biggest northern cities um just after the rebellion and, and like, know, yeah, we are... the wave, yeah yeah exactly and so that was that was really that was a really fun arrest kind of pointless um have you got a picture of that have you got a photo of it did, did probably see? somewhere there's a picture of Mina lying under the banner actually no my my cover photo is me holding hands with Adam um like yeah from the back of the back of us um looking at the road so yeah that's that's um that was a good one what um, on Facebook, your cover photo on facebook on facebook yeah oh okay i have to look i have to look at that cool it has my um the yellow high vis that roman gave me the first time we were doing stewarding he was like this is my favorite but you can have it and i was like yeah yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so i still got that that's a good little memory keepsake um yeah, but, I mean it's not pointless. I mean, you know, it, it, those kind of things, when they're unplanned, I think, like we can talk about this, but more spontaneity, I think, in exile would be a good thing because it, it's not just about, it's not only about whether you achieve something through the action. It's also about just practicing, 
it's practicing being in those confrontational spaces isn't it and it gives you more confidence yeah. Definitely. And I think that was that was what was so incredible about the beginning of XR. It's like we've managed to somehow get these people who had never really considered themselves getting arrested or even going that like as far as, you know, doing anything illegal because they're so committed. And, you know, hundreds of people have now got arrested because of this. And they're like throwing themselves at this for, you know, like, why? I mean, this was amazing that we managed to do it. Um, but yeah, it was like, it was a massive confidence boost for so many people. And we've definitely lost some of that. And, and I, I remember kind of, you know, now I compare like what we felt at the beginning of the, I mean, maybe it's just, yeah, like being able to compare from, from completely nothing to doing, to doing that bridge takeover where, you know, we just put out on Facebook, be, be at the bridges at nine o'clock, wait for the signal, take over the road people turned up and just sat in the road without any kind of you know signal from any kind of experienced activists because they cared and because there was like this rebellious nature to it and then compared to now it's like you have to really consider every single action and what consequences every single action is going to have and then you know like we are way too much swayed now um by the people who are on the outside saying oh that's a really bad idea like oh you shouldn't do that it's like we didn't care back then like we we were we got told that we were never going to be able to take over parliament square on the declaration we got 1500 people sitting in the middle of the road for three hours like we didn't care back then and now we've we care way too much about criticisms and obviously we need to think more carefully about about some of those criticisms but it's like so many actions that i've kind of tried to organize have been battered by these people by like you know these people that just are completely anti-xr and it's like well where did our rebelliousness go like we've totally yeah. lost it yeah because like um um yeah i mean before we spoke about i mean I, I don't know whether it's necessary for you to talk about any other actions you've been involved with but um right now but um like i mean what you've been talking about just then i mean when we spoke before we talked about how so there were the bridge blocks and then that was november 2018 and then a couple of weeks later you did this thing in manchester and then in april april 2019 was the big the first big london takeover the april rebellion which i didn't go to i, I didn't go to either of them I, I only did the bridge block but um but after after that april rebellion we spoke about how there was a clear turning point for you i think you said where things and i think for me as well actually where and um, last time we spoke about how things became more the momentum was lost and things became more fear-based mm. like like it wasn't so much based on courage and love anymore and and grief it was it was more based on fear and being afraid of losing our new recruits and being afraid of what people think of us and and there was suddenly there was a lot more bureaucracy about on board onboarding people and um just trying hard to keep hold of all the new facebook subscribers after the april rebellion and all the new youtube subscribers and 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 like before we spoke of maybe this is when we should have given it given the rebellion to people in the sense of okay we've got the principles now just go off and expand it in other cities but instead it was like the opposite it was like there was seen to be suddenly more centralization even though at the same time people were speaking more about decentralization it's almost like the opposite happened um mm. somehow um and we and last time we spoke we related that to partly a problem with leadership culture and that the the, the co-founders much as we love them um, became a, a victim of the media culture of seeking leaders and so you've got gail and roger and not so much any of the other it was mainly gail and roger really i think like repeatedly invited well, some of the others now as well actually like repeatedly invited to talk at events and things which gives this sort of impression that we have these strong leaders. And, you know, 
I'm not saying anything personal against these people and it's great that this movement has been started but that's part of the problem isn't it I think that the leadership leadership culture is a bit I mean it's good if we can all be leaders in a way like we can all step up at different times and we can all lead in our own way but so I'm not against leadership I'm not like I mean I am an anarchist in a sense but also I'm not against a strong leadership culture in the sense of everyone can be a leader i mean you lead yourself first of all you know how to lead yourself and then you can lead your friends at certain points when they when they give their consent and but there's some problem i mean it's interesting you, you spoke about you've been involved with consent workshops and i wonder whether any of that involves the consent to be led because mm. it seems like in xr it's come to the point where people are led without giving their consent somehow yeah i mean it's really it's become quite difficult um recently or maybe in the uh, well yeah i can't really tell time anymore but you know maybe it has been since april um but in in the consent kind of in the consent circles we've been talking about yeah exactly that like how do not only are we breaking the consent of the public by blocking their roads, for example? But are we actually breaking the consent of the people just because, we, you know, we're, we're dragging them along with this exciting thing and it's not necessarily what they want to do? Um, and I'm really torn with that because, like, yeah, like you say, we can all be leaders and we should all be leaders. And I don't think that a lot of us are really... We're, we're kind of dragged down in this bureaucracy um, and try and and we are used to being told what to do and you know there are some people who are used to telling people what to do and we are finding ourselves in that culture too much rather than being like trying to like empower people empower everyone to be a leader um yeah and yeah i think that's like a a really important point that we need to kind of keep hammering home because i half do also think that we just need to show people that we need to get out of our comfort zones because th you know this is the only time this is it's not going to get easier from now on like it's going to get way harder for the rest of our lives and we should probably get used to it and we should probably do a little bit more while it is easy um yeah rather than, like you know worry too much about this but yeah it is it, i think like i said it's become really relevant recently um in the north especially because we're kind of I feel like I always try to make make it seem a little bit more dramatic than it is, but I I feel like it's also not that much more dramatic. But you know, I'm not a northerner; I'm a southerner. But I've lived in Manchester for five years now, and I can see just from that time, um, and even just from the eighteen months in XR while I've lived in Manchester, that the North are consistently, uh, you know, sidelined in in kind of. Uh, decision making processes um just as most other regions outside of london are but you know particularly the north when it comes to and scotland and when it comes to the rebellions we have the furthest to travel we have the least amount of support we saw it in october where um uh yeah we had Millbank, nobody sent support everyone was like oh my god go to the bristol site or come on everyone get to trafalgar square which is the london site like these are really important sites nobody ever said Millbank was an important site and we were just left to, I didn't know, even know that. anything was happening that what <laughs> exactly <laughs> um but yeah so we've been trying to kind of there's been a lot of discussion about how to kind of not necessarily split off as a region but kind of reinforce ourselves as a region of extinction rebellion rather than just like a you know a, a few local groups of this kind of central movement because it is central let's be honest and it became like very very um consciously central after april um and there are still these kind of there are still people in the movement that are kind of you know religiously following roger hallam as in as if he's like this kind of yeah prophet or something and he's an amazing guy he's really you know he has so much knowledge but it's like he has this simple idea that we are going to get this many arrests and then that'll solve everything yeah. and he's still you know he's still following that narrative and there's so many people that are just like yes that that's that's all we need to do that is our strategy that's where we started 
um, and that's all we need to do and that we need to listen to the the co-founders who started this movement um, because you know they had the knowledge they had the experience and it's like okay so so they started this movement we've you know consequently created um uh so much can you still see me oh, I can now. okay um yeah we've we've consequently created like you know so much of this movement but we still have to follow these co-founders as if they're like you know they have all of the knowledge uh i don't think that's very decentralized no um and i remember i remember actively saying after april or maybe it was even before april sometime around april um last year when i was delivering the talks there's a bit that says we are a decentralized movement and you know we we say it anyway we're a decentralized movement and i remember saying like making myself actively say we're not decentralized we are de we are decentralizing it's a process we're definitely not there yet we have to unlearn so much of what has just been deeply ingrained into us from yeah. society um and that's a really important point that we need to keep hammering home is like there is still a very central part of XR that makes all these decisions that has all that holds these com these important conversations within small circles of people and those circles are made up of the same people you know there's diff the same people in each of the circles mm. and information is not getting out and it's complete it's particularly relevant right now in the north when we're trying to kind of yeah merge but, away, or not merge, merge away yeah split off slightly um but in a sense it's our own fault for listening to them because you know it's it's all a bit of an illusion that could shatter quite easily because if you take the principles and values literally of XR, which Gail Bradbrook and some others crystallized, I think before XR, I think they were principles and values of rising up. I don't know, but I think that's where they originated. Um, if they were followed, that's the ironic thing. If they were followed properly, then Gail wouldn't be seen as such a leader if we were following things that she came up with and others as well. Um, so we're all victims of this leadership culture but also we all obviously we're all responsible for it and we all need to act but like for instance if if a group of us had the confidence to get together a small group of us and start like some massive campaign of escalating actions which ended up with blocking the seven bridge or something um or uh, that's a bad example but you know something no, that, <laughs> that's something that has nothing to do with London basically <laughs> um, then I'm sure we would get loads of people on board and the people in London wouldn't like it but they couldn't claim it wasn't XR because if we're operating by the principles and you know and not deviating from the sacred logo and and, <laughs> and all the rest of it then there's not much there's not much that they can really say about it that anyone can say about it like mm -hmm. um, and like I think even the people who do end up having a lot of power, I think they can be quick to humble themselves, um, you know, moment by moment when the moment calls for it. I mean, I saw Gail Bradbrook, for instance, on a XR TV thing, like some group call that was put up on YouTube. Or some some meeting or interview XRT it was put on YouTube, and someone phoned in. It was a live stream, and someone or someone wrote in on Facebook or something, and it was some random person who had started a new Facebook group, Facebook group XR anti capitalist, and I think it was just like earlier in the same live stream that Gail had said, "Oh, we don't say we're anti capitalist as XR," <laughs> and then and then. And then this, this person wrote in and she was reading it off. Oh, this is from XR anti-capitalist. And she suddenly looked slightly sheepish. And then she said, oh, well, you know, that's fine. That's an independent group. You know, anyone can set up a group with a principle. And she took it really well. And it's like, we need more people setting up these so-called random offshoots. Because mm. I think the more it happens, the more the so-called leaders accept it. Um, yeah, I mean, well, to be fair though, I, like I always remember um, the strategy of of kind of decentralizing was that any group could set could set themselves up um, 
as XR and that was always kind of seen as the way to go forward um yeah but yeah it's just it is just quite funny when you know we are kind of strictly non or non-political what does that even mean um yeah. and you know we don't say that we are anti-capitalist because it would alienate the right um or the center right or even the center or even Sorry. the center left, even the center left yeah yeah um and so yeah we don't explicitly say that it's just yeah it's, it's ridiculous in my opinion well i like the idea of consensus building so um like progressive what we've been thinking about recently progressive as in steps of consensus building so like personally i i can see at this moment in history we might need some still some capitalism because you can't get rid of it overnight without a bloody revolution and i don't want a bloody revolution um but i but ideally i do want to live in a post-capitalist world where you know where there's very 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 minimal social hierarchy if any at all um but i just wonder whether we could have instead of trying too hard to have a universal ideology as xr or so-called non-political which isn't really true doesn't really work because everything's political um is can we have a like progressive consensus over certain actions so we you know all the capitalists and anarchists can agree at least that we don't want a certain kind of capitalism a certain corrupt kind of capitalism so oh you know we already do have and lots of movements already already do have like an action consensus where you so you know maybe we need to focus less on a broad consensus and more on just action consensus and, and bring the anarchists and the capitalists together on a specific action because we can all agree that a certain amount of corruption is bad and well that happens anyway this is not rocket science yeah i mean i think there's still an issue with that that you know um we have we do, we do have an uh, um action consensus and and hoping to get consensus well yeah i guess there's a slight irony to that you know like here is our action consensus from xr um as long as you you know as long as you play along with it then we're all good right um and you know is that was that con consented by consensus whatever by by the people that are joining us and it, it happened exactly um that way in october when we tried to create this movement of movements which was basically um an attempt to try and uh broaden well yeah i mean i guess not alienate um primarily well other social movements i guess um by saying like you know we are all in this together um these are all of our struggles let's let's create this um authentic genuine movement of movements um so you know if you'll just sign these forms and then um come to our streets um what here's here's your section of the road to to do this um and if you can use you know if you can use some of our flags that would be great and um you know here's some tents and here's a little bit of budget um we're creating a movement of movements um <laughs> joint and collaboratively that's cool um nobody no. seemed to see that that was that w there was a <laughs> massive difficulty in that um and that's you know that's that's one of the problems and, and the conversations that i've had since of just trying to um trying to really make meaningful conversations between different like m environmental movements or organizations or other social organizations um have been met with like yeah kind of re real kind of hesitancy or just complete like completely anti this idea um because we don't want to alienate the right or whatever like it's just if we i feel that like there's so many conversations going on about what our role is or what is our strategy or like you know how what you know we had that whole kind of upheaval of um our current strategy during like january and february where this group got together um that was somehow democratically chosen within the movement um and and completely it spent nine days on this tr completely rewriting the whole xr strategy only to come back with this document that basically was just a che checklist of all the different criticisms that we've ever got as a movement saying we're going to solve this we're going to solve that we're going to solve this and we're going to work towards that 
and I was like, that's not a strategy at all. I don't think, I don't actually know if anyone in that group knew the definition of a strategy. But anyway, um, I, yeah, it, it's just sh shown to me how much, how much ego is in this movement that um, we think that we can create our own strategy. And I went to um, a Reclaim the Power weekend a couple of weeks ago. It was all online. I went to a workshop that's was titled um what is reclaim the powers uh role in the wider ecology of movements um and again it became apparent to me during the workshop that it was like well why why did why did one single organization get to decide what their role is um on their own in this wider ecology of movements like we haven't really got a wider like we haven't really got a kind of coherent ecology of yeah. movements we People. haven't ever had these conversations where we can collaboratively yeah. create this joint strategy and we can't because of that we can't then decide what our role in it is because we've never like appreciated or recognized that there could or should be a joint strategy yeah no i take that yeah i totally agree with you and i mean that's something i'm trying to do with my own like website and youtube channel is is develop well i'm developing this theory i'm sure it's not original but i'm calling it pandemic strategy and the idea is not just what kind of strategy do we take as activists during a pandemic but also the idea of an activist strategy that becomes so widespread um, in every quarter of activist society and, and every quarter of the wider society that it becomes like a pandemic that it's on everyone's lips and it's so culturally embedded that it's everywhere and it's not something that's confined to meetings about about yeah. um so it's something that is moving forward all the time and but it's all very vague but um but i would just like to respond with i did send you a text about this but um so the movement of movements thing have you heard of the uh platform by 2020 we rise up yes yeah you did send me yeah um, so it's i think i don't know what they're thinking with that name i mean maybe they'll change the name when it gets to 2021 but but anyway apart from the name which i think is a bit weird what they're doing seems amazing like i subscribe to their email list i haven't had time to join any of their calls but basically they they are doing the movement of movements that xr is talking about so they they're creating a platform where lots of different movements across europe it is a european exclusively mainly thing but that's okay it's a, it's a good start um all they're doing is providing meeting spaces and common digital tools and forums for people to discuss strategy without owning it they're not trying to own it and they're very careful to say we're a platform we're not controlling what happens we're just facilitating movements joining together and then you go and on their website and there's like 20 or so movements that have signed up um including extinction rebellion spain so that's mm. quite, so that's quite interesting like why it, my question is why hasn't if xr uk is so concerned about a movement of movements why haven't they joined at, at least for an experiment why haven't they joined by 2020 we rise up and my only skeptical answer that comes back in my head is because they're too up their own asses but I, don't, I, should, I shouldn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> well, no, but that, yeah, that, that's a really big part of it. Like, I, I got told the other day that, and I don't want to say this because it is, I got told by a really, really good friend of mine, um, whose opinion I value greatly, but, you know, that, that XR has, you know, one of the most coordinated groups um, out there and or, or, you know one of the mo the closely um the closest to well coordinated group out there and and it kind of just like it wasn't that particular comment but just that that comment that reminded me of this kind of attitude of xr that we are going to solve this that we that we're going to win this game and it has always been there because i had that feeling when i joined that's why i joined that's why so many people joined the movement was because we were like wow this is going to change something and you know i said it literally at the beginning of this interview like there this is going to change the world and that has continued to you know be in the minds of so many people um who have just kind of stuck to this xr narrative or this xr calendar or this xr way of life 
and have completely like therefore ignored so many other perspectives and strategies and um yeah different different kind of journeys or pathways that we could go down um and yeah it's it's like a I think that is something that's going to really hold us back as a movement is this kind of ego thing um there is also a part of it like this time last year I was invited to join um or represent XR Manchester um in this kind of greater Manchester climate action network it's like an alliance of different groups so that you know the conversations have been trying to happen for a while um and there was this one big thing that we were trying to uh sought out which was the um greater manchester green summit which was basically where the council had um or the combined authorities had kind of made loads of um promises what they called yeah um targets the yeah. year before their first ever green summit um of different kind of environmental or sustainability things um and we were all going to join up and create this campaign against it saying this isn't enough like we've had a year nothing's happened you said that you're going to do this it's 2019 now um you know we're far away from what you said you were going to do and i was representing xr and we had a few meetings beforehand and a lot of the conversation was like cool really glad you're here lizzie we're representing xr but we're not going to be that radical and you know like not everything is kind of not everything should be that radical and we have other ways of doing things and I was like mm, that's really kind of yeah that's really really kind of difficult to work with when you know XR have have had a lot of su success because of how radical they've been um comparatively you know across the world not not that radical but anyway um and it was just like, okay, well, are we really going to kind of lower our kind of radicalness for the sake of other groups? Or are we actually going to try and find some kind of, you know, raise them up a little bit and give them confidence? And so there is that element of trying to like, you know, do we want to become part of something that is one of, like of the old narrative of, clim of fighting climate change? I don't, you know, that might be kind of uh i don't know i mean i can think of a specific example of this kind of old narrative is do we want to join the green new deal um are we kind of you know relying on the yeah. electoral system to kind of save us and do we want to yeah collaborate with them at all do we want to put our name on that probably not no. but do we want to do what they're doing and actually meaningfully engage different organizations across cities and you know also get because yeah also get some of the people that they're using because these people care like do we want to try and collaborate or are we just going to completely cut them out Scott, yeah like, i know yeah it's really difficult i mean i had a really fascinating call recently with someone called janine o'keefe who's one of the founders of the fridays for future movement um mm. and she, she's in sweden she spends her time between sweden and australia she's in sweden at the moment she knows greta's family um she was involved it's funny because greta thunberg she kind of is a symbolic sort of um figurehead of both the school strikes movement and the fridays for future movement which are actually separate movements i've only mm. sort of realized this recently and the fridays for future movement isn't just youths it's a lot of adults as well and i didn't realize that until recently and so i had a call with janine about partly about this concept of a movement of movements because she's a bit of a Roger Hallam fan but not in an unrealistic way she's quite grounded I mean she's sort of middle-aged woman um, she seems to have a really good perspective on things actually um, and the way she put a movement of movements is that you walk into a field of wheat and you come out the other side and you've got lots of or, or a field of grass like a meadow or something and, and you've got lots of different specks on you from all the different plants and and all the different specks represent all the different movements and so we all need to mix up so much not just in like these official meetings but at, but we all need to mix up in with you know between movements so much that 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 culturally culturally we become 
a movement of movements rather than something that's decided at meetings. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to do that when we've all got limited time, but I guess it means sometimes, uh, sometimes diversifying our time a bit more, I don't know. But, and another, another really interesting analogy that we sort of simultaneously came up with, because she was talking about the Gilets Jaunes, Gilets, Gilets Jaunes in, in France, and she was saying for a movement of movements, there are limits because like you were saying about does XR want to engage with traditional climate activism on the on the other side of the spectrum she was saying oh I don't know whether Fridays for Future should be engaging with Gilets Jaunes and I said to her well actually if we want a movement of movements I wouldn't expect Fridays for Future to engage with Gilets Jaunes but I would expect XR France to engage with the Gilets Jaunes which apparently they have done a bit so mm. and then so she brought up this idea of a rainbow saying every color has a different level of action so a movement of movements doesn't necessarily mean but then i came straight back at her and said well if you've got a rainbow each color merges into the to the color either side so so yeah xr is one color the gilet jaunes is another color so xr should work with gilet jaunes but Fridays for Future is on the other side of XR. So Fridays for Future wouldn't work with Gilles Jones, but would work with XR. And so you can sort of see things a bit like that, maybe. And that's probably one of many. It's not going to be an, an analogy that works in every circumstance. And that can be the problem with this kind of analogizing. Some, is that a word? Sometimes is that um, people make these nice analogies and then and then think that they're solid things and stick to them too rigidly but if we can have lots of these ideas I think the rainbow one is quite a cool one because um yeah we to create a movement of movements like I think we should try and include everyone but not personally expect to be working with everyone do you know mm. what I mean like we're we're we're, we're never going to work with XR is never going to work directly with deep green resistance because Deep green resistance advocates severe criminal damage and you know like shutting down infrastructure like and, and they're underground they're, they're definitely underground um, but in theory you could have some members of XR also doing DGR stuff and and giving some vocal support to it at least like Gail Bradbrook has for instance like said in a radio interview that she fully supports underground actions sabotaging fracking equipment and like if more of us were saying stuff like that and vocalizing yeah sorry i'm going off on one but um, yeah, but it's, yeah yeah it's it's just like like you say it's it's not just about doing like actions it's just, or or being in meetings it's about just having these conversations and you know like if we can and yeah, it is, it is, it is an issue of, of time limit, but if we can show that, you know, like so many, if so many people in XR Manchester are also volunteering in the lo local soup kitchen or, you know, for the Refugee Rights Collective or for, yeah. um, in the garden, you know, the gardening project down the road, um, then it's like, cool, we've already got those connections. Like we're already, you know, working together in some way and we use their skills they use our skills like we can share and that's why you know i d so i had this idea um of that's not my idea but like kind of trying to connect the two different ideas of time banking with activism um and that's a great you know i guess like you you are kind of like playing a really important role in this kind of concept of, of just you know um exploring the different kind of experiences of different activists in so different social movements um or different yes environmental movements but this this idea of um t exchanging time um not just so like there would be yeah my idea would be like there would be three levels of it so kind of and the first level would just be kind of traditional time banking so that's like you know i give an hour of my time because i can because i have a van and i can drive people around if they need it um and in return i can get an hour um, of whatever is on offer so it might be somebody being able to come and unblock my drain or something um, and you know that way we can really kind of build 
links with the community and try and like eradicate this isolation that we find ourselves in um and then the next level would be like um different but like basically focusing on education so we'd give an hour of uh a, you know a talk to whoever wants it on how civil disobedience works and in return you know rojava or the kurdistan kurdistan solidarity network given our of their talk like a talk on on the council systems in rojava um and then like the next level in the kind of crudest form i wanted to try and figure out a nicer way of saying it but you know we could say okay we're gonna bring you know, we can mobilize people in xr we can do that fast that's one of our things that we can do um <laughs> as if we're like magicians <laughs> um, we can bring 100 people to your protest and you know we, we can promise that and in return you can bring 50 people to the streets of london for our thing and it was like i don't know i was kind of playing in my head just thinking why aren't we doing this already like why aren't these conversations happening like we have this idea that in our own there's so much kind of hatred for different between the different movements yeah. you know specifically rtp and xr there's a lot of tension yeah. between the two and i didn't know that just well i mean maybe there isn't maybe i'm just playing it but i did kind of uh, early on in xr i went to a earth first um one of the earth first winter moot things and there was we, me and Joel and Ian Bray were asked to do um, a, a a workshop on XR and and like the criticism and kind of try to you know dissolve some of the myths about XR and and deal with the criticisms. And there were about fifty sixty people in the room, all staring at us. Really badly facilitated meeting anyway, but it basically just turned into this XR bashing thing where pretty much every single one of the people had to have a go at xr and were kind of like attacking us a little bit and it was just a really i felt really awful after it sure. um and there were a couple of people in the audience or the in, like, participants who raised their hand being like well no i mean like rtp were in the same situation a couple of years ago let's let's be honest xr are like six months old at this point you know they can't do everything like why aren't we giving them some credit and that just you know really showed to me like yeah well why 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 are you criticizing us why aren't, why isn't it productive why aren't you helping us like we've we've obviously shown that we can do something we're all kind of on the same side like what is all this kind of hatred and it's just it stems so much from ego yeah to, to bring it back to the first point <laughs> in this section <laughs> i think that's fun i think that's a fantastic idea about activist time banking because for egotistical reasons or whatever like often we are worried about as human beings as activists um are we giving to are we giving are we giving too much are we compromising too much so so having having a time bank system could make it really simple clear boundaries for different activist groups so that they can work together with more trust because they know that it's being organized in a time banking system that could that could be really interesting actually like yeah that sounds that sounds like a great idea that could be part of the part of this one of many solutions um i know it is half three but um i know you need to go and prepare for another but can i just quickly mention a couple of projects which i've already mentioned to you privately um so yeah so for the benefit of the wider audience so as part of the potential money rebellion. No. What happened there? I don't know. Just, you just suddenly froze and then left no, the meeting. All right. I don't, I didn't actually. Oh, no, I hope. It should record. Like, I didn't actually press leave the meeting, but then something came up saying reconnecting so i'm sure the first i'm sure the first one definitely said recording no i know but the thing is when we spoke before mm. and then i rejoined it said it it said it was recording then and it didn't but um i'm sure this will i'm sure it will almost <laughs> well if not we can just record the last half of again <laughs> yeah but the first half no, no, it should definitely be. First would be recorded. Yeah, it? I'm sure. 
so yeah, I just wanted to quickly bring up. Um, so the XR is moving forward with this money rebellion. I don't know quite where it's going, but um, as as a sort of adjunct to that or a project related to that, I've been talking with you privately about this company, the student loans company, or rather Erudio, which is a private company which took over some of the student loans companies debts and this company Erudio they're managing half of my student debt anyway it's a few thousand it's not as much as many people have but Erudio is managed by another group called Carvel Investors and Carvel Investors are heavily invested in fossil fuel projects and the aviation industry so I was talking to you about the possibility of doing a debt strike specifically with this company Erudio and whether other students because lots of students have their debts managed by Erudio so um but you don't know yet who's managing your loan do you your your debts no so. but I'm gonna go and find out I don't know how to find out but I'm figuring it out because yeah we're just, but, yeah. We're just reminded. reminded I just, me of a I just wanted to mention it just in case anyone who's watching if there's anyone who's watching who has a student debt with Erudio, please get in touch. And the other one was this idea of, and I don't know whether this idea is going to fly now because of like being in a post COVID world, as people keep saying, um, this idea of Extinction Rebellion Arctic Alert International. I set up the Facebook page ages ago and then didn't do much. I, I was in contact with a couple of people from Norway and a couple of other people, but the idea of sailing some yachts or chartering some yachts and, and sailing some yachts up to the Arctic Circle, especially the Barents Sea, which is above Norway, where I think they're starting to pretty sure and obviously needs more research, starting to explore for gas, gas drilling. And, and because the Arctic ice is melting faster than ever, um, potentially there's going to be more oil and gas exploration up in the Arctic Circle and more shipping, industrial shipping. And seeing as we're in a desperate planetary situation, I just wondered whether XR or, doesn't even have to be XR, but, but it could be a lot of people in XR might be interested in like doing a Greenpeace style, like at, at least like a show of presence up in the Arctic. Um, but I don't know how much of it is just I want to go on an exciting adventure. <laughs> well, both, because I think that's a really amazing idea. And I'm sure that we can get some really experienced sailors. Like, you, yeah, we spoke about this last time, didn't we? I'm sure there's loads that are keen to do this. Yeah. Yeah, let's get them on board. Yeah, I think, I think it'd be great. So, again, if there's anyone who's watching who knows anything about sailing um, or who has friends in the north of Norway or on Greenland even, Siberia, Alaska. <laughs> <Don't Anywhere. get> <laughs> um, so yeah, do you want to, like before you go, I don't know if you've got time, do you want to quickly do that thing where you um, talk to the camera, give a message to the camera? I mean, last time it was about Rojava, it can be again if you want. And I'll just go out of the frame. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so last time I said uh, I held up a book called Revolution in Rojava um, and said everyone needs to read this um, because it is the probably the most important revolution going on at this moment in the whole world. Um, and they are currently being crushed by uh, Turkey and all of the other sides. Um, but yeah, I don't. I, I finished that book on Wednesday, and I don't have it with me to show. Um, but yeah, I, I would say read that book because the way that they organise is absolutely crucial to how um, all well how the world should organise. But as a start, how all social movements should organise. And since since doing the previous version of this interview, um, there has been, well, I've heard of um, this group in XR called Trust the People Project, which is 
basically doing exactly that which is amazing um and it hasn't really got the kind of xr attachment to it it's just you know mobilizing people um that are already kind of interested to uh to join to basically start up neighborhood assemblies and their aim is to create a neighborhood assembly in like across the uk in all neighborhoods in the uk um to make decisions for that neighborhood um and so i'd say yeah read up about the trust the people project read up about the roger the council system start a neighborhood assembly and honestly let's join this or let's yeah kick start this democratic revolution because that is how we're going to solve this and one more thing on that if you're completely you know if you if you even have a little bit of hope i i have very little hope that we'll get out of this situation um but now one of the things that is kind of spurring me on to to start these um councils or to to actually you know start the foundations is the fact that when rojava started um their council systems or some of the kind of health health councils and the women's councils this was back in early uh, late 80s early 90s and they ex they've explicitly said they wouldn't be where they were today if they had not had those foundations um that they could build upon and you know they wouldn't have made it like you know basically to democratic autonomy without that so i'd say yeah let's start this now and we will at least have some foundations to give to future generations in even if most of the hope is lost <laughs> i think that's it <laughs> that's fantastic in a really um, long rambling way <laughs> that's okay i might cut off just the very end of it i'm not sure where i'll cut it off actually but no that that was amazing um i didn't know about that group in xr that's go what was that called again about the neighborhood of sam trust the people project okay but it's not is it done as an xr thing uh it's not really got xr symbols on it it's the same font and it's so like to to a unknown viewer it wouldn't be um but they're not trying to do it like bringing xr um yeah they're not trying to like yeah wave up xr flags around while they're doing it cool oh, i'm definitely going to check that out i mean i i had the same i'm sure lots of people have had this idea but i'm just, i'm amazed i mean i'm amazed and encouraged that this a, a group is actually putting this forward that's that's amazing mm. yeah yeah i was so excited when i heard about it is, is that like is it all over the country or based in the north or in london or at the moment um they haven't really started it it's, it's a, just a group of people of a, i think about six seven eight people um who are majority london but also all over the country who are now just like telling people about it and trying to get um kind of reps in all of the different parts i think they're very in their very early stages okay because there's you know there's we are plan c do you know about them mm, i think you mentioned them last time i think they might be doing they might have tried something similar at least in in one of the northern cities i don't know but um, mm. they're worth uh, i hope the two i hope that they link up with or have a look at we are plan c these people but um yeah okay well anyway we've we've both got another call at four so thanks so much thank you that was really good yeah and it and it felt really natural and flowing like it yeah so yeah well i hope i wasn't rambling too much no 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 it was it was, it was amazing really great mm -hmm. so yeah when lockdowns anyway yeah i'll come and see you sometime but, yeah that'd yeah. be good well, have a lovely rest of your Sunday. Have you got any more of these interviews coming up? Um, well, I'm actually talking to someone at four who's, I don't know if you know her, I've never met her, Holly Anna, Holly Anna, someone, Christian Climate Action. Uh, she was one of the main people in Christian Climate Action. So I'm going to be talking about the possibility of a specifically Christian rebellion in the UK. Like, I'm Ooh. not, I mean, I'm not Christian, but I do see the, the need for like a christian rebellion a buddhist rebellion a muslim re rebellion you know like mm. on their own terms as as part of the movement of movements i think we need that 
definitely yeah, yeah. so and then oh and then i've got a really interesting in, uh interview with in a couple of days which we're going to try and really spread a lot because it's about a corrupt bank in latvia that he tried he blew the whistle years ago this is actually a banker i'm going to be interviewing he blew the whistle years and years ago about this corrupt bank and still nothing's been done so he wants to give it another go because he has made videos before but he wants to give it another go and i said that there might be some people in extinction rebellion might want to push it a little bit because mm. it has got links to gazprom the russian oil giant and it's mm. like linked in with the russian mafia and it's it's really like big stuff like i'm not sure really whether i should be getting involved but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's gonna be sick i'll definitely watch that one yeah yeah so, um but yeah carry on with your amazing like i mean obviously you will carry it like good luck with your amazing initiatives like yeah that like uh, the time banking thing sounds good mm, yeah i'm really excited if i can actually if, uh, it's been in my mind for like four months now and i haven't done anything but well it's hard i mean maybe maybe the time won't be for it just yet maybe it will be for uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah but okay. we will never to yeah make it work right lots of love to you lizzie and you Nice to speak to you and to yeah. see your face. And you. See you later. See you soon.